Hello, Trader Chris here with the third video in the series of uh, videos looking at the type of content that uh, we as teachers uh, can do in each phase of an ESA lesson. And so this video is about the types of activities that we can do in the activate phase. Now, the activate phase is the most important part of the lesson. This is where the students are trying to use the language that's been taught in the lesson in a communicative task. Uh, a speaking task, if it's a conversation lesson, and uh, a writing task, if it's a writing focused lesson. And this is what will tell you, as the teacher, whether or not your learner objectives have been met or at least to what extent the learner objectives have been met. And so we need to consider carefully uh, the type of activity that we do uh, in this phase. But it's an activity that has the students doing and saying what your learner objectives state. Now, luckily, there are quite a few uh, different types of activities uh, that we can do for the activate phase. Um, so you should be able to find one that fits. And so what we're going to do now is to have a look at uh, the different types. And what we're doing here is we're looking at speaking activities. So uh, first thing I want to do is to share my screen with you. And uh, I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint here. Okay, so as I said, we're looking at types of activities that we can do for the activate phase. Now, uh, a lot of what you see uh, about online teaching uh, is one-to-one -one teaching. But what we're talking about here uh, is in fact online group teaching. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give you a brief description of each activity. Um, how it can be conducted in a virtual group classroom uh, and also outline any sort of potential problems or challenges uh, that can come up uh, in conducting it in a virtual classroom. Okay, so let's go on to uh, the first one. Now, this is called information gap. There are in fact a couple of types of information gap activities. Uh, this is the first one where the students work in pairs um, and each student has a different half uh, of a set of information uh, and they have to ask each other and answer each other uh, for their missing details so that each student can build uh, the whole picture. Now how this is done in a virtual classroom is that um, first of all uh, let me just sort of back up a minute and say that uh, we are assuming that you're using Zoom uh, or any other type of platform that has the capability of putting students into subrooms, or as Zoom calls them breakout rooms. Okay, because um, for quite a number of these activities, uh, we're going to need that. Um, and this is a case in point. Uh, for students to work in pairs like this, each pair would be in their own breakout room. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, there could be sort of potential problems or challenges, um, and this does present a couple. Um, first of all, if students are in breakout rooms, then you cannot share your screen with all of the breakout rooms together. You can enter a breakout room and share your screen uh, that way, but then you'd have to do it one by one. Okay, so um, this is clearly, this kind of information is clearly something that students are going to need to have, um, but you won't be able to display it. Okay, so uh, the easiest way to deal with that is uh, to send the students uh, the worksheet prior to the lesson uh, and instruct them to have it to hand uh, for the next lesson. Um, it's important that whatever the activity for your Activate is, that you monitor. 
Okay, make sure the students are uh, doing what they're supposed to do um, and uh, that they're using the language that they're supposed to be using. Um, and again, while students are doing this in their breakout rooms, the only way that you can uh, effectively monitor is uh, to visit each breakout room in turn and um, you monitor that way. This does mean that this can take quite some time. Okay, so be sure to allow plenty of time for uh, this kind of activity or indeed any kind that has the students in breakout rooms. Okay, um, one other final point about students working in breakout rooms is that, as I say, um, you can only visit uh, breakout rooms one by one in turn. Um, and clearly, if you're in one particular breakout room, you're not in another. And when you're not in a breakout room, when the students are just on their own, they may revert to using their native language. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. Okay. On to the second kind of information gap. And um, if this looks familiar to you, if you're the type of person who uh, liked doing puzzles when you were younger, or maybe still do, um, this may look uh, like a spot the difference puzzle. Um, and indeed, it pretty much is, but it's done in a slightly different way. Um, again, the students are working in pairs on this, and each student has one of the pictures. And as you see, there are some slight differences between them. And so what happens here is that each student uh, will take turns to describe what's in their picture. And when the other student sees a difference in theirs, they will then describe that difference. Okay, so uh, by doing that sort of back and forth, uh, eventually they should uh, hopefully find all of the differences uh, between their pictures. Okay, again, uh, as this is done in pairs, this is done in a breakout room. Uh, and so uh, pretty much the, the problems, uh, the challenges I mentioned for the previous information gap uh, activity also apply to this one. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The next one is called Partner Information Share. Uh, again, students are working in pairs on this, although you could possibly extend it to make small groups of perhaps three or four. Um, and what happens here is that uh, each student asks their partner uh, about their experiences relevant to the lesson's topic. The example that we have here uh, is for the topic of routines. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, each student would just fill in uh, an adverb of frequency or, or another phrase of frequency to describe how often they do these things, and then they will ask their partner. And of course, the partner answers. But this is only the first part of it. Having done that, what the students will then do is to present their partner's routine uh, to the rest of the class. Okay, so this is in two parts. And uh, the first part, when they're working in pairs, again, that's in a breakout room. For the presentation part, you would gather every, uh, everyone back into the main room and they will give their presentation one by one uh, to the whole class in the main room. Um, again, while they're in their breakout rooms, uh, the previous challenges that I outlined uh, also apply here. Okay, on to presentations. Okay, so um, what we have here is that um, this is better for smallish groups because uh, you're having students give individual presentations, which will take a long time, of course, if it's a large group. And so what we have here is that uh, students will work individually to prepare. Okay, they should prepare. Okay, this is not Toastmasters. We don't want an off-the-cuff speech. Um, 
but uh, a presentation uh, for which they prepared. So you'll give them uh, a bit of time to write down uh, some notes and then they, they will tell the class uh, or present to the class what they've written. Okay. Now, as they're working individually, this is all done uh, within the main room. Okay. Okay, so now a very popular type of activity uh, is a role play. Usually role plays are done in pairs, but they needn't be. Some role plays could be small groups uh, or even large groups, uh, but typically they're, they're done in pairs. In this example here, we have a doctor and a patient. Okay, so uh, again, students um, should have a bit of time to prepare, to write out what they're going to say in their conversation. And then of course they act it out. Ideally, uh, you'll give time for two role plays. That is to say the students will act out the role play and then they'll do it again, reversing roles. Uh, that way the students get a chance to try both roles. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in order for the students to um, have prepared this, <coughs> uh, the preparation will be in, uh, as I say, being pairs or small groups uh, in the breakout rooms. Um, and then you can gather the students back into the main room to do their role plays uh, pair by pair. Um, but in order for the students to have been able to adequately prepare their conversation, uh, it's important that they have written down all of the relevant language um, that you've covered throughout the lesson. So that's something perhaps to um, check that they're doing uh, as the lesson progresses. Okay, moving on to the next one, creating materials. Okay, so for those of you that uh, have already finished the online course book, uh, you will have come across an example lesson in there where students create a super animal. Okay, and so it may look something like this. Uh, typically, this creating materials is not done individually. Um, it will be done at least in pairs, but um, probably small groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so for the super animal lesson, the instructions will look something like this. Uh, first have them draw a super animal, um, and then they'll obviously uh, discuss amongst themselves, and they have to write down, uh, in this example, four things that it can do, and four things that it can't do. Um, that's the preparation part. Uh, again, that will be done in breakout rooms. And then you gather the pairs or small groups back into the main room and they will then present their super animal to the rest of the class. Um, and in doing so, uh, they will be describing what it can and can't do. Again, students need to have written down all of the relevant language through the lesson uh, so that they're able to write this description. Um, and it's important as well during the presentation part that you closely monitor this uh, and make sure that all of the students are contributing to the presentations. Okay. <coughs> Moving on then, and the next one is having a discussion or a debate. This is typically for higher levels. Uh, to be honest, you won't get much discussion or debate from low level students. But of course, um, you won't always be teaching low levels. Uh, and so when you, when you come to the higher levels, this is certainly an option for uh, an activate activity. Um, so students will basically discuss the lessons topic. This is typically done as a whole group. Uh, could be done in smaller groups as well, though. Um, and so in this example here, we have basically giving opinions. Okay? Um, a student will give their opinion, and the other students in the group will agree or disagree with that. 
Okay, and you could also have them say why they agree or disagree. Uh, this could also be uh, sort of based around an article or a video. Um, and if it is, then uh, that article or video would need to uh, be sent to the students uh, prior to the lesson. Okay, so they have it on hand. Okay. Okay, now the next one is conducting a survey or a slight variation of a survey is uh, a classic uh, ESL or EFL uh, activity called Find Someone Who. Now, with a survey, you're finding out how many people of the group uh, do a certain thing or have a certain thing, whatever the question is. With find someone who, all you need to do is find one person from the group that does that or has that or whatever. Okay, so um, the way these work is they're conducted as a whole group. Okay, and um, students will then present their findings uh, to the class. Uh, if you're doing it as a whole group, then you can stay in the main room. Although this might get somewhat noisy uh, if students are speaking at the same time. Uh, smaller groups can be in breakout rooms. Uh, and when the students are presenting their findings, then certainly that should be uh, back into the main room as a whole group. Um, Again, the same kind of challenges uh, as we saw in the uh, information gap activities apply here. Uh, this questionnaire, if you like, uh, would have to be sent to the students beforehand. Uh, and again, uh, you should be, if they're in breakout rooms, you should be uh, visiting each breakout room in turn to monitor. And again, that can take some time. Okay then, so the next one is story building. Okay, this is, this is quite a good one. Uh, building a story using text prompts or, as we see here, picture prompts. So the students look at the pictures and they will construct a story. This is typically done in small groups. Uh, and so the good thing here is that um, there should be sort of some slight variation in story from group to group. As you can see here, these pictures are lettered in a certain order, A to H. Uh, you can keep those letterings there so that the students know the order. Or you can actually make things slightly more difficult by removing, uh, removing sorry, the uh, order. Uh, and the students have to put the pictures into what they think is the right order first and then make their story. Um, as I say, this is typically done in small groups, and so those will be in breakout rooms as well. Okay, and as before, uh, these prompts, whether they're text or picture prompts, would need to be sent to the students prior to the lesson. Okay, moving on to a team quiz. A team quiz is quite nice. This could be uh, teams of two, sort of half and half, um, or indeed it could be uh, more than uh, two groups. Uh, the example picture here uh, shows a quiz between four teams, in fact. Um, now, one way of doing a quiz is that you prepare the lesson, uh, sorry, you prepare the questions uh, beforehand, and you would be the quiz master, as it were. But in fact, uh, a slightly better way of doing it involves no preparation for you at all. Isn't that nice? You'd have the students selecting the questions. Okay, the, the way this works is that each student uh, on each team would find a question, obviously based on uh, the lesson's topic, the lesson's content. They would find a question to ask a member of the other team or one of the other teams. Um, this acts as a great review because uh, students can, can get very competitive in this kind of environment. They want to win this quiz. Uh, and so what they're going to try and do is find 
uh, the most difficult question they can to try and trip up the other team. Uh, which often means having a really good look back through the lessons material to find such a question. So it acts as a great review for them as well. Okay, and um, this is done in the main room. And you, of course, would keep score. Students do want to know who's winning and ultimately who's won. Uh, and so what you can do is you can uh, share your uh, whiteboard screen and keep score on that. Okay, moving on to the next one, and this is basically a conversation um, with questions or prompts. So um, students will work in pairs, typically pairs, could be small groups, um, and they will have a conversation based around uh, a question uh, or a prompt. So in this example, we see um, that we're instructing the, uh, each student in the pair to ask their partner about their last vacation. And gives a couple of uh, questions to start them off. And the idea here is to build a conversation as a conversation would build in the real world. That is to say, based on answers that a student gives, uh, the partner would then ask uh, follow-on questions. Okay, so uh, gives a couple of uh, sort of general examples there. Okay, so uh, and we can see how long these conversations can last. Um, as I say, typically they're done in pairs or small groups, and so these are in breakout rooms. Uh, as before, these conversation cards would need to be sent to the students beforehand. Um, which is quite good, even though they won't have covered the language yet, at least it gives them a chance to sort of think about it uh, prior to the activity. Uh, again, you'd need to visit the breakout rooms uh, one by one in order to monitor them. Okay. Now this is a rather fun one because it has the students using the internet here. Information gathering. Okay, so, uh, you ask the students for some information and it should be information that you pretty well know they don't actually know the answers to. The information is of course based around uh, the lesson's topic. In this example, um, the topic of the lesson is transport. And so what we see here is a particular form of transport with uh, three questions about it. And you should, be, you should be pretty sure that students do not know what this form of transport is and therefore can't answer these questions off the top of their head. Because the idea here is for them to look on the internet, go onto Google or similar and find the answers to these questions. Uh, and then the idea is, is that once they've done that, um, gather the students back together and each student will present the information they found to the rest of the class. Now, if you're doing this individually, if you've got a small group, you can do this individually and therefore everyone can stay in the main room while they're doing their research. Uh, and of course, the presentations uh, to the whole group should be in the main room. Um, if you do have students working in pairs, then of course that uh, needs to be breakout rooms. Uh, and again, uh, we have the challenge of uh, the students not being able to see your screen uh, during the activity and therefore you need to send the questions to the students uh, beforehand. And the final activity that we're going to look at for Activate is a board game. Okay, now this can be a little bit tricky. Board games are great. Again, we have this kind of competitive element going on. Um, and basically, uh, students will play against each other. You could have two, three, or four students all playing together on one board. Uh, the others can observe, and then they will take their turn. Um, 
And what happens with board games like this, uh, if you look at the questions on this example board, uh, you'll see that they're to do with routines. Okay, so uh, students move around the board according to uh, the throw of a dice or similar. Uh, and whatever square they land on, their opponent will ask them that question and they have to answer. Uh, this is done in the main room and you can display this board uh, by screen share. The tricky thing here though is you also need to display your means of having the students move across the board. Uh, typically that's dice, could be something else, uh, but that needs to be displayed as well. Um, as does the pieces on the board that represent each student. Okay, because it's a bit, um, I'd say mentally challenging to keep it in your head where everyone is on the board as they're moving around. Um, quite honestly, I haven't figured out a way of being able to display uh, the board, the dice and the pieces. So if you know such a way, please let me know. Okay, so these are 13 possible activities that uh, you could use for uh, your Activate. Um, quite a range, and so I'm sure that you're able to find one that uh, suits your lesson and uh, your topic. A um, couple of points, whatever type of activity you've chosen, a um, couple of things to bear in mind here. Uh, firstly, every student must speak. That's very important. Uh, as I say, we're, we're trying to gauge to what extent your learner objectives have been met. Okay, students will be able to say something, talk about something, describe something. Um, and so it's not good enough just to be able to uh, assess some of the students. Okay, so we need all the students speaking. Um, and they should be speaking in full sentences and questions as well, not just um, individual single vocabulary words, for example. Uh, apart from setting up the activity, you, the teacher, should not be involved. Okay, and that means that the students should be uh, talking to each other, not to you. Um, and by the same token, uh, you shouldn't interrupt. While the students are getting on with the speaking part of the Activate, um, you shouldn't interrupt them to ask them further questions or to correct them. What we're trying to do here is to build their speaking fluency. Uh, and they won't be able to do that if they're forever being interrupted. So uh, let them go from start to finish and you will then be able to give your feedback and corrections at the end. And as you saw, a number of these activities involve uh, or consist of two parts, a preparation part uh, and a speaking part. Um, for most students, particularly low level students, that preparation part is essential. Uh, they must be given the chance to prepare what they're going to say. Okay, because it's a, it's a bit unfair to expect uh, particularly low-level students to be able to pull an entire conversation or description just off the top of their heads. Okay, so give them that preparation time. Okay, so let me stop the screen share. Okay, there we are. So uh, now we've looked at um, a number of activities and uh, different types of exercises uh, that you can use for each phase of your lesson. Engage, study and activate. So if you found these lessons useful, please give us a like down below and subscribe uh, for more great content. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Bye.